Ever wonder how pitching angles are created? The answer lies in a connection between the chest and the arm, and it's related directly to location. And once you understand all that, you may think differently about long toss. Do you ever wonder how to best teach pitching mechanics to a nine-year-old? You'll learn how, and so much more, in Season 4, Episode 13 of The Fix. Season 4, Episode 13 of The Fix, featuring Pitching Motion Troubleshooter, Angel Borelli. And Angel, welcome aboard. Hi, Joe. How are you doing today? You know, I'm a little under the weather. You can you can probably hear that I have a little bit of a nasal thing going on here. A little cold, but otherwise doing just great. Well, thanks for thanks for uh, putting in the effort to do this show. Hey, let me tell you something. The show must go on. <laughs> I think I've heard that before. <laughs> that's what that's what we say in the podcast business. Yes, exactly. So we're on episode 13, and every year. I wonder if we should like skip episode 13 like they do on the elevators and on the floors of the tall buildings because 13 is unlucky to a lot of people. But then again, 13's very lucky in places like Italy. So Yes, and I'm Italian. It was my mother's uh, lucky number and also it's the day, date of her birthday, the 13th. So no, 13 is a good number for me. So... Yeah, I agree. I agree. And yet I, th- I think the gamblers in Italy, when they say to do a 13, it means they hit the jackpot or something like that. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. yeah so we're going to move forward with the Baker's Dozen episode. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, aren't you funny today? <laughs> You've got jokes. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's probably the, the medication I'm taking for the okay, cold. Oh, boy. Okay. Well, this is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. It's always fun. Well, in any case, uh, we are recording in the middle of September, so most coaches and players are knee-deep into fall ball now, and we're just going to keep extending this fall ball thing because we're in fall ball and we're getting a lot of feedback about what's going on with what coaches should be doing, what pitchers should be doing, and we're going to just keep moving along and helping helping everyone out with that. And we're also going to be changing things up, starting with the next episode, with the Lucky 14 episode, we're going to start bringing some guests on and we're going to have some coaches, hopefully some scouts, some pitchers, some parents. We're going to see, we're going to mix it up and get some different perspectives as we, uh, as we roll through the off season. And our first guest in the next episode will be Larry Owens, who is the head coach at Bellarmine university. And he also was a minor league pitching coach in the White Sox organization, as well as an area scout for the Red Sox. So we're going to be kicking off our guest list with uh, some pretty high-powered personnel here. So I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, Angel, you've known Larry for a while now. Well, you know, he actually has been following the podcast, I think, for years. But I didn't actually um, really realize that until last year. He started contacting me and uh, asking me questions. And so, yes, over the last year and a half, I've gotten to know him. And the reason why I think he's going to be a great guest is because here's a coach. I mean, if you read his profile uh, at the university, this guy has done everything. He has an extensive background. He is going, it's going to be an honor to have him on this show, but the questions he asks me are so good, and he is an example of what I always talk about, which is coaches have some smarts that they don't even know about, and he just said to me recently, you know, you, there's things that I thought I knew, and I didn't know how to say it, and things I think I see, and I wasn't sure, and he said, and because of the way that I break things down, he was getting some validation and some ways of at least understanding what he always thought he was seeing. And that's a huge compliment. So he's going to be great. So listen to all the listeners. He's going to be on in our next episode. Please send in all your questions that you would want me to ask somebody of his caliber with his background as a scout, as a pitching coach, as a head coach, anything at all that you need for me to ask him. We, of course, are going to come up with some great questions, but um, 
yeah let's take advantage of this and he is very excited about being on the show and you know being able to teach the audience and thank you all for all the questions you send in all the time and that's what we're actually going to be doing today and Joe Larry said something so interesting actually every time I talk to him I learn something as well but he said something so interesting the other day we were talking about a picture uh, he had me look at some video and he was mentioning about you know the thing we talk about a lot which is location he we were indirectly talking about the pitcher locating the ball but what he said was tell me if you think this is as interesting as I thought I thought this was interesting he said he really looks for a pitcher that can create angles with the ball delivery and of course that's in that makes sense right and of course it's like well of course yeah location you know and the trajectory and that's how you locate the pitches but I have never thought about it in terms of the way he said that a pitcher needs to be able to create angles with the delivery of the ball isn't that kind of an interesting way to to think of it that is a very interesting way to think of it that's a perspective that I never really thought about in those term and out that those terms but I I can see it I know I know what he's talking about absolutely yeah and so I want to have this topic be about that so I went on to because the minute he said angle of course my you know I not only was I like wow Larry that's such a cool way to think about it but then I was able to tie it back to what I do which is well how does a pitcher create an angle for the pitch an angle for the ball and as you know I am the body motion person I'm the one that I mean creating an angle isn't just oh I'm going to create an angle there's a way that your body does it so it it entered into a whole discussion that I had with him and I want to share it with everyone because I think this is an important thing now and it also kind of ties into the last show and in fact the question that I uh, you uh, um, talked about last time with getting downhill and you know when do you start the stride that actually came from Larry he ha- asked great questions but this kind of connects with it because of course last week was about you know get your stride right so that you can get over the the front leg but once you're over the front leg I guess you do have to create that correct angle or you waste all that motion so here's the deal about creating an angle with a pitch and this is an another thing to add to your arsenal coaches when you're trying to get a pitcher to hit his spots because mostly you're probably dealing with the grip you're probably dealing with the wrist making sure he's behind the ball you're probably maybe looking to see if he's looking at his target and hopefully now you're looking to see if he's squared up to the plate and if his stride looks right because all these things are what we talk about to have great location but here's the deal about the angle now I want everyone to think about this anybody who lifts weights or even if you've never lifted weights but you go in a gym everybody's at least been in a gym when we talk about training the chest whether you use dumbbells or whether you use machines if you'll notice there are machines on different angles so you'll have a flat bench you'll have an incline bench you'll have a decline bench that's for dumbbell work if you're on a machine you'll see handles that you push straight out some handles you push 45 degree angles out and some handles might even push downward when you see people doing push-ups they're doing them flat they're doing them on an incline with that means their hands are higher than their feet or they're doing them on a decline they got their feet on a bench they're heading downward into the ground and that's how they're doing the push-up Joe do you picture all those things absolutely I'm also thinking about TRX straps yes exactly I'm not a fan of those for pitchers but you're absolutely right people get into those in different angles so in the gym the gym is a a playground of angles now when you're training the chest anybody knows you're going to do a lot of different angles and the reason is is that the chest has different heads meaning you have you don't just have a pectoral muscle which is the name of the muscle that's one big 
muscle you have muscles you have heads of that muscle and the heads the way the chest inserts everybody kind of knows where their chest is in fact if you put your hand over your heart and if you spread your fingers open as your hand is over your heart the chest muscles go up across the shoulder into the arm and insert in that same way that your fingers are fanning out right now you've got a lower pack You've got the middle pack, which would be just the flat angle. You've got an upper pack, and you actually have a head called the clavicular pack, which is right under the clavicle. All of those fan out into the arm because the chest moves the arm. So I think you can see where I'm starting to go here, right, Joe? Yeah, just don't get into geometry because then I'm going to fall fall apart. Okay. <laughs> Okay, then I'll put my protractor away. I was just going <laughs> to do that. You know me. <laughs> you know how oh, good yeah. I am at math. But anyway, so anyway, so in the gym, we have to use different, we want to, like a bodybuilder is going to do all those angles because he's got to fill out the chest. And so the chest muscle inserts into the arm. It's one of the major accelerators of the pitch, meaning that it brings the arm forward. The lat's the second accelerator. Well, I don't want to say chest and lat first or second. They're the main accelerators. The lat's in the back, but it wraps around to the front of the arm. Here's what we know. The lat and the chest bring the arm forward. The arm cannot bring the arm forward. The chest, which is located on your trunk, which is a very stable part of your body, it doesn't move. It moves in one big unit. The arm is controlled by the chest, i.e. the shoulder joint. So, we, we got where you want the arm to go, depending on the angle of your arm, you're going to use a different head of the chest. So, for example, if somebody's using, going to th hit a volleyball straight up over their head or even a tennis serve, the muscles used for that are going to be different than if you stick your arm out to the side like with a tennis racket and you want to go straight across, you know, parallel to the ground. You have different heads that actually control the angle of the arm. Now, the head that is used primarily for pitching is the lower head of the pec. It's why all my guys do decline work. And you'll see all my guys doing incline push-ups, not to confuse anyone, but the incline push-up with the, uh, head, the hands higher than the feet actually recruits the lower head, preferentially. So my guys do that. Why? Because I want that muscle to be strong, so it pulls the arm down on a downward plane. So the downward plane is the angle that Larry is talking about that he wants to see on the ball. He wants to see an angle. So when you're working with all the tools you have, make sure you understand that that arm is connecting to the chest. Now, does that make sense so far, Joe? Yes, it does. Okay, cool. So in terms of training in the gym, pitchers, all of you should be doing decline work. Okay, now... Let me take this a step further. This is why when you ask someone with my background, well, what do you think about long toss? 250 feet for the pitchers to uh, strengthen their arm. You have to know why I shake my head and go, strengthen the arm. He should be strengthening the lower pec to bring the arm down. And in long toss, you're using the upper pec. Now, should the entire pec be strong? Yes. Is it a problem for a pitcher to throw that far? Well, I don't know if it's a problem. It really depends on how he does it, which is the same thing for throwing 60 feet. 60 feet's bad for someone who doesn't do it right. But don't call it strengthening the arm for pitching. Don't call it pitching practice call it we're going to throw long distance today because well I want you to <laughs> because I can't think of a reason why you should but coaches if you have a reason just don't label it 
because you're not really training the downward angle. So this is why when I look at a pitcher and he's got so much time to do so many things, it doesn't include throwing 250 feet. Now this isn't an argument against long toss. You know I always say be educated and make your decisions. Do what you think is best, but label it correctly and also know that if you're going to be doing things that aren't exactly perfect for the angle you want, you better match it or balance it with enough throwing that does work that downward angle. So there we would have, obviously, 60 foot throwing. Pretty much you can get a downward angle at 75 with a shuffle step or a crow hop, but once you start getting beyond 75, not, once you get to 90 or 120, you're going to start having a different angle to the ball. So this is so important to know. So pitchers, along, pitching coaches, along with all the details you're using this fall to help your pitchers locate, make sure to remind them that uh, that angle of the arm is stemming out from their chest muscle and not from just the arm itself so that now you can create an angle from a bigger part of the body that they have more feel for and also to all the strength coaches listening and to all you coaches that have strength coaches go to them and say hey make sure you're including the lower pack the more and for the pitchers to, when they're training to know that's the um, muscle that brings the arm down this is a great thing for them to understand to get more control over their pitch so isn't that a cool connection that is a very cool connection so if someone's doing a lot of long toss should they offset it by doing short toss well, I think absolutely you have to. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure in the long toss program, they take you out and then they take you in. And I do know because I, I have heard discussions about long toss, uh, not many, but I know that they they say, okay, as you come in, pre pull the ball down. So there is some awareness that we want a downward angle. But if you want a downward angle, put your body make the task you see the body is task oriented if i know i've got to throw a ball 60 yards or 70 yards i know i've got to throw it up and it's got to go up because i know it'll come down and then I'm going to get it further. I'm not going to probably do it like sidearm because it won't go very far, right? We know that you have to have upward and downward motion to throw the ball far. So if you are cognizant of the fact that you want the pitcher to pull down on the ball when he's doing long toss, my question is, well, why are you even taking him into zones where he isn't pulling down on it? He's throwing upward. So I am absolutely certain that if you did EMG, G studies, meaning really looking at the heads, you would get different activity because they've already done this in the gym. So when you're pushing the dumbbells up on an incline bench, you're working the upper pack. The lower pack and the, the major pack, uh, uh, the, the, the larger head, are definitely firing. You never can shut off all parts of the muscle. But it isn't promoting the angle. And when Larry said angle, I'm like, wow, that's so cool. And that brings in a whole discussion about the chest, which creates the angle of the arm. So now, coaches, you have something to bite your teeth into in terms of information about location. The, sh the chest has to be pulling the arm down. I don't care what you do with the wrists and the fingers if your chest isn't pulling the right way. And of course, guys, for people who release differently, the sidearm, he's using a different part of his pec than the pitcher who is, you know, uh, up, at a, uh, up at a different angle, higher than a sidearm. So anyway, this is a little more, more information for you, a little more information for your arsenal of weapons that you use to help your pitchers locate the ball and to understand the pitching motion. Okay, I have a nutty question. Okay. Would it make, in, make any sense at all to put a pitcher on a, a mound that is, say, three or four feet higher than normal? For that to no, well, you know, I'm. I, I, here's what I think, and you know, everyone has to have a philosophy. And if you've heard me speak before, I I, I promote 
philosophies thinking. I want you to create what you believe in. And I believe that to, to develop a skill, you have to practice it the way it's designed. So the answer to that question would be for me, no. You create the strength of the muscle in the gym and then you let them get their feel because you see it's a precision skill and this is where I want everyone to always go back to when you're coming up with all these things that you want to do to make someone do something better this is a precision skill that pitcher has to hit throw a ball I mean when you watch the games on Sunday and they have the the strike zone Joe when I see that box there and I watch pitchers all day long. I'm like, how do they do that? Do you know, especially when they're like, oh, I'm going to hit that inside high corner. I'm like, oh, my God, how did he get that spot? That's not a big zone. So this is a precision skill that you have to do with speed. And you're doing it downhill. With So let's talk about that your terrain isn't that stable, right? You're going downhill. When you have something that's precision, you have to practice the precision of it because anything can throw it off so for example coaches this may be a time to think about wow so and so is having so much trouble finding the plate you know what maybe I shouldn't have him do long toss maybe I should have him totally do 60 foot flat just to warm up but then he should play catch downhill Maybe I should have him, you know, stick to the distance throwing. Maybe I should have him flat ground at 60 with the catcher down flat. You know, I just gave you two, three ideas. And I'm sure you guys with your genius have many more. But it's a precision skill. So match the precision. And the further away your pitcher is from being precise, I know you have pitchers which you know look good, which you know have good arms, and you go, why can't he hit his spots? Well, start dialing in the precision part of it. So review what you do. And again, I'm not trying to talk you out of any of the things you believe in. But don't have a cookie cookie cutter approach to your pitchers when it comes to this. So with what I just taught you about the use of the chest, the use of the arm, and what's necessary, think about each pitcher and see if he's doing the right thing for him so you can help him display his excellence he wouldn't be on your team if he didn't have some talent well nice idea though joe <laughs> <laughs> i love your i love your question because of course what you were saying is should we exaggerate it right but here's that's what the gym is for so that's why i laugh my pitchers who've been with me since they were 10 and now they're in college they laugh when people tell them they throw the ball hard for arm strength or they throw a weighted ball for arm strength. They laugh because they're in the gym doing dumbbell presses with 60, 70 pound dumbbells. That's how you get strength in your chest. They know the way to get strength. They strengthen the muscle and then they go out and use it. No different than a football team or a runner. It's the same sport. It's the same. Sports are sports. You train your body, and then that body is better when it gets to the mound. So your question was a great one. Well, what it sounds like to me is that in a nutshell, pitchers should, when they're throwing a baseball, should most of the time be on the mound throwing 60 feet. That's nothing much more exotic than that. Just keep it simple, right? Yeah, keep it simple. Keep it simple and allow them to develop the mechanism that help them do a precise uh, skill. Now, listen, since we just are, we've touched on long toss a little, I want to continue on because I got some great little small questions from listeners and I want to address them because if one father or one coach calls me about something, I know that this is a question that other listeners have so I got a call and this is a question we've got to remember to bring up to Larry because I didn't really know how to answer it completely the father of one of my pitchers called he happens to be someone that I hope we get on the show I've worked with two of his sons and one of his sons just went off to a college and his son who has worked with me since he was eight 
and he's got a, a scholarship as a sophomore, so he's in college right now. The coach asked him, has them do long toss. This happens to be a coach that likes long toss. He likes them to go out beyond 200 feet. My pitcher was trying to not disrespect him, but just try to keep it like short distance just because he's never thrown long toss. He's a PO, has always been. Long story short, the coach saw him, and of course the coach doesn't know, and said, hey, you, you know, do what I ask you to do. So he started doing, of course, the long toss, and his arm got sore for the first time in years. He's never had a sore arm. He has never had an injury, and he's a power pitcher. And he, the father called me concerned, and he asked me to talk to the pitcher. So what I instructed the pitcher to do was to, number one, never don't just do what he asks you to, because the coach doesn't know if he's insolent, you know, having attitude or whatever. I said, but go to the coach and just talk to him and say, is there any way that I can ease myself into the longer distance? I've never thrown long toss. The reason why I'm bringing this up is coaches, for those of you out there that want to do long toss or you want to use weighted balls or all the things that, you know, through your own investigation, you believe in. And that's why you have a job. Somebody likes what you believe in. So I'm not suggesting that you don't do what you want to do. I want you to be educated. But if you are using some of these questionable methods, methods that some, some of us think are not good, the ones that are questionable, and you all know which ones they are, and even long toss, please round your guys up just like you do. I mean, every time I see a pitcher, the first question out of my mouth is, when did you pitch last? How many pitches did you throw? When do you have to pitch next? I got to sort of position him at where is he at? Your first question should be when you find out who these guys are. Who, who if Let's say you're going to do long toss. Who throws long toss here? How far do you go out? How, how often do you use it? Have you ever used it? Get a sense of them. And then accordingly, dole out what you want them to do. If you think a pitcher needs to throw long toss, he's already throwing well, but you want to add that in, he's got to work his way into it. So please, when it comes to the exotic methods and long toss is on the list of things that are the things that we have the most controversial questions about, is it good, isn't it? Ask the pitchers where they're at with it. Don't just have them do it. Again, your methods, I'm not asking you to question your methods. I'm asking you to, to be careful about how you dole them out so that somebody isn't doing something that they're not prepared for. And, uh, you know, that's the pitcher was so happy and I said you've got to pull the coach aside and talk to him and just you know d say I'm happy to do your program but could I work into 90 feet first then 120 then 150 etc cetera, etc cetera. and I think that's a reasonable thing and I told him there's no coach that wakes up and says I can't wait to hurt somebody's arm today the coach has so much on his plate that he doesn't know what's happening so I encouraged him to just take him aside and I said don't do it when he's in the middle of practice you need to talk to him with respect outside of practice and see if there's a way you can work it in so that's my recommendation to not forget to do that yeah as a as a former coach myself I think that's the best way to handle that kind of a situation uh you know I coached in a lot of different a lot of different age groups and maybe I have in the past done things that we're asking too much of a pitcher or a hitter or a runner or whoever it was. And if that individual came up to me the way you suggested and said, Hey coach, I don't think I can do this, but I'm going to try and I'll, you know, just give me some time to work up to it. I can, I mean, that's from my standpoint, that's a very good way to handle it. Uh, I have, mm -hmm. I have a question for you that, that pitcher who's never done long toss before he got into this program, does he throw over 90 miles an hour? Uh, he's he's a high 80s hitting 90s pitcher, and yes, his goal is to hit 90 and be above that. But he's he throws hard. He, he's considered a power pitcher. He threw hard. I would say high 80s hits 90, 
and that's they, that's why they offered him a scholarship when he was a sophomore. He was, com, uh, you know, verbally committed to the school. Well, there you go. There's a there's an example of a power pitcher who doesn't do long toss. Not not yeah. not to poo poo it, but just yeah. just point putting it out there. Yeah. You know, there, there's something else that strikes me that I want to address also with coaches. You know, expecting a a pitcher to come into your program fresh off and throwing. 200 feet or however far you want your pitchers to throw it it's sort of like asking a football player to come in and start bench pressing 500 pounds i mean you don't know for sure if they can do it you know before you start some kind of a program like that it's a really good idea to sit down as you suggest and talk to all of your pitchers and say hey how far do you throw you know before you start a 200 or 250 foot long toss program yeah, we, well, you know, Joe, you're reminding me of something really important here. And so, coaches, uh, this is this is uh, actually this is in your defense. So, uh, I know there's coaches out there that think that weighted balls are great. Uh, you might have strength coaches out there that think when a pitcher picks up one of those huge black medicine balls that weighs <laughs> 30 pounds and he rotates and throws it, that this is you know, wow, this is the way to get him to rotate fast. There's coaches out there listening and pitchers probably listening that love long toss and think it's great and this is not to take away from them this is actually in defense of of something but to i want to expand your knowledge when you are and, and this explains also why a coach you know you there might be one coach listening saying geez why didn't i think of that yeah i shouldn't have them throw you know move out on the first day i guess i should have asked them what happens with people who haven't spent their hours sitting in a classroom like I did, studying, 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 doing all the studying that you guys think would be boring, and I loved it, to study from the cell all the way out to the outside of the body. When you haven't done that and you work in sports, mostly you're looking at things from an external perspective. You look at a pitcher throwing a a baseball that looks like a baseball, but it's black, and it weighs 12 ounces, and you see him throwing it, and you go, well, that really makes sense. That looks kind of cool, and yeah, he's throwing something heavy, so then if he picks up something light, that thing's going to really sail. That's going to be great. Of course, that would look good to somebody who's just visually looking at it. Hey, I want my guy to just back up and back up and throw the ball. After all, he's just throwing the baseball. He's just throwing the baseball. When things are happening on the outside, there is an effect on the inside. You're affecting from the outside in, you're affecting the muscle, you're affecting the tendon, you're affecting the type of contraction that muscle's having. To go lower, you're affecting the ligaments, therefore you're affecting the bones. How do you think little kids get bone fractures? For all you parents who have kids with growth plate fractures, that bone was affected because the ligament was affected because now I'm backing out of the body, because the muscle was affected, because the tendon was affected, because something he did on the outside affected him all the way down to his bone. Things have an internal effect. And when you study, when you do what I do, or if you're a medical person, we know that the outside is just evidence of what's happening on the inside. So that's why I love doing this show, because my job is to remind you and to teach you of things that you're not expected to know. I do not expect coaches to know the things I teach. It would be a boring show if I always talked about things you already know. I'm the one that sat in the classroom. You guys are out on the field. We combine our knowledge. We can produce great things. And coaches that reach out and want to learn more I have a great deal of respect for him it's why I've selected coach Owens to come on the show because he asks questions and he is not afraid to say wow that's cool and he loves it when he tries it and it works and that you know what that tells me he's a great coach and he's smart I never think oh someone's dumb because they didn't know this I think wow they're smart because they asked so Remember, everything you do on the outside has effect on the inside. And when you look at something like that 
and you look at the picture and you look inside his body, what's this doing to the insides? It'll give you a way to modulate some of the activities that you're possibly uh, teaching them. And I just think that's the difference in uh, somebody coming from my background and someone who's in a sports background. Yeah, that's. I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out, Angel, because, uh, you know, as coaches, our knowledge is limited. And I think it's really important that we understand that we have some limitations on what we know because we did spend more time on a baseball field than in a classroom in, in most cases. So I, I agree with you 100%. So I just want to cover one more thing before we close the program because I did get a call from a father um, who is a coach um, and actually he's a doctor and he's also a coach of a nine-year-old, uh, a nine-year-old uh, team. And he had two really good questions for me. One is, uh, you know, he, he, he was looking for a good warm-up program with bands and, and he said parents, and so of course he called me about my program and he, his question was a logical one. Hey, you know, I know older guys do it. Can young kids do it? But he also said, people were freaking out as parents saying working with bands it was like he was asking them to lift weights or something and that was the first question he asked and then he asked about youth pitchers with mechanics I want to address those very quickly but um, if a pitcher and this is what I told him if a pitcher is expected to go on a mound and throw a ball he's old enough to warm up his arm the warm-up program that I have the kids that are eight use the same band as the kids who are 18 or 24. You don't use a heavy band because this isn't a strength program, it's a warm-up program. So the band you use is light or extra light. And yes, a nine-year-old should do it. And in fact, on the DVD, if you look at the cover only, everyone's big. And then there's Little Tyke on there, who's not so little anymore, but to show that this is for everybody. So if your kid is old enough to pitch, he's old enough to prepare his arm for that pitching. So that's the first question. And the second thing he asked was how to work with mechanics. And this is what I tell every coach of youth pitchers. Teach them how to play catch correctly at their pitching distance, which for this uh, coach, it was 46 feet, meaning teach them the basics. We know that you turn your sideways to the target, you step and you turn. Little kids think you face the target and step and turn. They think the minute you turn, you throw the ball. They have no sense of, no, you don't throw the ball yet. You hang on to it for a second, and then you throw it. To teach them to teach them effectively, teach them while they're on flat ground, playing catch so you can actually work with their mechanics because they don't have a cognitive part of their brain. So they, when they get on the mound, they're thinking, strike the guy out. They're like these little tough guys who they don't know anything about modulating their pitch. They get on the mound and that's like, okay, it's go time. To teach them something while they're on the mound is very difficult. So whenever I work with someone that's 9 or 10 or even 11, their brains start to develop more at 12. But at 9, 10, and 11, make sure you have them playing catch correctly and start to enter in all the details of the pitching motion, how to use the glove arm, how to step out and have the foot be in the right place, how to make sure the ball isn't thrown right away, how to come out of the glove correctly. Do all of this playing catch, have it match exactly what you would teach them if you were teaching pitching, and then 90% of your work is done. And when you have them looking excellent playing catch, put them on the mound and say, do the same thing you just did, and you will be so happy. Don't knock your head against a wall trying to teach pitching mechanics on a mound to a nine-year-old pitcher. It'll take you all year. You do it on flat ground, becomes a whole different ball game because they don't know what you're up to. And their brains are open to all the information. Huh. It's it's funny that this was your last subject because I got a almost the exact same question, or at least I saw the exact same question in a uh, Facebook group that I follow of baseball moms. And these baseball moms were discussing at what age do they start hiring a pitching coach for their 
little tykes. And, and there was one mom who answered, oh, well, we started our kid with his pitching coach when he was eight years old. And I was thinking, oh, my goodness, it, at eight years old, you, you can barely throw the baseball. Like, just focus on trying to throw the ball. I mean, and, and you've pretty much encapsulated exactly what was going through my head. Well, yeah, and, and they do need instruction. Uh, it, it's just you have to have a coach that understands how to instruct at that age. And, and, and guess what I know, and I know all you coaches will be shaking your head. I was shocked to find out that by the time a little boy is 12, he's already a jock, and he's trying to be competitive with all the guys on his team. So if you don't get him before he's 12, you got to undo bad things. So up until like 9, 10, and 11, you can redo – it's not really undoing. It's like redoing. They're more like gelatin. But there's something that happens to their heads when they're 12. And boy, they, they start to take on a persona where they have a little 12-year-old swag type thing. And now, you, now you're now you working a, you're working uphill at 12. Uh, nine, 8, 9, and 10, and 11, you're kind of more going level plane or downhill. It's like simpler. You, you can coax them more. But I was shocked to find out how at 12 in baseball um wow that's almost uh, uh you, you, like i said you're undoing things so yes they need instruction they need the right coach they need a coach that's a teacher and that really embraces it's just like the way you pick out a teacher at school or you pick out a school or if you had a kid that wasn't learning something you would shop for a tutor that a good teacher teaches off of what the child the the learner the student needs not what they have you know everybody asks me what program do you have I have a million programs I have whatever program I have to design in the moment for the guy who's standing in front of me I have no program the only thing I have set in place is my DVD and my elbow strengthening book but other than that when I'm working I look at I'm listening and I'm watching and then I design, every day I'm designing a new drill based on what a pitcher needs. So a good teacher knows how to, They we just have a lot of stuff in our pockets and we pull out whatever's needed for that student. And that's what you want to do when you have a youth pitcher. So I love that this coach uh, asks these questions because the questions a coach asks tells me he's a good coach because he's asking these questions. He's not just doing. And uh, so I think it's great. Joe, but I have to ask you, Baseball Moms, that's a Facebook page you're on? I'm, I know you're Mr. Mom now, but <laughs> I didn't know you were taking it that far. Hey, I think it's important to, to see what the, uh, <laughs> what the Baseball Moms are thinking and saying. And if there's something I can help with, hey. I admire you in a, in a whole new way right now. <laughs> and there's my curveball to Joe, the best catcher in the world. <laughs> and you notice how simply he caught it? <laughs> I am a catcher. I know you are. I know you were a hell of a catcher, too. Oops, I said hell on the podcast. <laughs> well, Anyway, okay. Right. Well, that's it. That's it for me. I'm uh, my creativity just ran out. <laughs> All right. Well, now that this is uh, evolving into a comedy routine, I think we've uh, done enough. <laughs> exactly. Angel, as always, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Yeah, I appreciate the your being here. And fall ball is the fun season for sure. Yeah, and coaches and pitchers, thank you so much for listening to Lucky Episode 13 of Season Four. We hope you learned something and we you can take to the mound. And uh, if you want to learn more about Angel and what she does with pictures, or if you have a question, you can go to her website, gymscience.com, G-Y-M-S-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. And we're going to be back in about two weeks uh, once again with Larry Owens. So you're not going to want to miss it. And in the meantime, we wish you safe and effective performance on the pitching mound.